head and give him praise. Offer unto him spiritual sacrifices. Legro Godozo Bere Ketina Kelina Mamambre. Legra Gadabo Zocolo de Brena Ketina Gegene Gelina Mojocolo de Babra Gadabo Zocolo de Brena Hatali Ketia. Agebo Jacaya. Praise you, Father. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Lamb of God. Father, we praise and bless and honor the name of Jesus. And we thank you that we are called by that name. And we bow our knees and our hearts unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, of whom the whole family in heaven and on earth is named. Oh, hallelujah. We are named by your name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We are called out of darkness into this glorious light. And we thank you, Lord, that the entrance of your word giveth light your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And we rejoice that we're walking in this light and the light keeps getting brighter by the day as your word keeps growing on our inside. And we rejoice. Thank you that tonight revelation knowledge is gifted everybody under the sound of my voice. Leko, Katima, Nakoto, Libara, Katina. Whatever is not planted by God is rooted out. Sickness, disease, terminated. In the name of Jesus. Karoto Sekia. Membro Gadozo Bereketina Kata. There's somebody that is listening to me right now. Right now you're listening to me and you've been battling with thoughts. You've been battling with thoughts. It's true that your physical body has been under an attack. You've been having infirmity, a disease that you're battling with. But you've been battling with your thoughts. And the reason why you are yet to experience your physical healing is because of the state of your mind. Now I hear the Holy Spirit say to say to you, Abraham considered not the deadness of Sarah's womb or the deadness of his body. Consider not those thoughts. Consider not those thoughts. Consider not those imaginations. Yeah, yeah, you've been healed already. You've been healed already. But go beyond those thoughts. Consider not those thoughts. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider Jesus. Don't consider the thoughts. Don't consider your feelings. Don't consider the report from the doctor. Consider Jesus. Consider Jesus and the victory that he has already provided. And suddenly you will find out that it's not the way you thought. And it's not the way it seems. And it's not the way it appears. You've been healed already. So rise up and walk in that healing and remain healed. Thank you, Father. And Lord, we rejoice for the massive victory that is released to your body right now. Legro Tosaka. Consider not those things. Consider not those thoughts. Consider not those sayings. Consider Jesus, the apostle and the high priest of your profession. Thank you, Lord. Now we call the things that be not as though they were in your situation, in your life, in your marriage, and in your circumstances. You receive in the name of Jesus. Praise you, Father. As your word comes forth tonight, your word comes forth with clarity. Your people built up, equipped, edified, and Jesus glorified. Thank you, Father, for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name, and every believer says a powerful amen. amen. Glory. Amen. Lift your right hands to heaven. Let's release our faith together as we say these words. I am born of God. I am born of the world. The word of God is my nature. I do not struggle to do the word. I do the word naturally. Therefore, today, I will understand. The word of his grace. I will be built up. By the end of this service, I will never be the same. Never ever be the same again. In Jesus name. And every believer says a powerful amen. How many of you can sense victory in this atmosphere tonight? Can we celebrate that victory that we have in Christ Jesus? Glory to God. Oh! Victory over sickness. Victory over disease. And victory over every suggestion of the enemy. Can we celebrate that victory once again? Glory to God. 
Whoa, whoa. Amen. I tell you guys, I tell you there is victory for us. And through the course of this day, it will be victory at every turn. I'm not hearing that amen at all. Victory, 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 victory. Katobalata, victory. Amen. Grab your pen, your notebook, and your Bibles. You can be seated with your sweet smart self tonight as we get into the word of his grace. We want to welcome everybody connected by way of Kingdom Life Network, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. All of our social media community, brothers and sisters online, let's get the word to the ends of the earth. This is the year to walk, walk, walk. Let's fill the earth with the fragrance of Jesus' grace. So do me the favor you've always done. Share the videos, put them on as many groups as possible. And also make sure you tweet in the course of the service. Let's, let's get busy on Twitter. Our tweeting is getting to a lot of people. So let's go ahead and tweet tonight as the word comes forth. And don't forget the tweeting is with the hashtag NCCM2023. That's the hashtag for tweeting. But I want to thank you all as we continue to flood the earth with the fragrance of Christ. I also want to welcome the radio audience in Aquaibom State. Wherever you're hearing the sound of my voice, what a joy to have all of you as our church family. We love you. We're glad you're growing and learning Christ. And you're shining God's light in the area where you are around Aquaibom State. Help me, do the, help me with a favor tonight. Call a friend, a family member. Ask them to tune to this radio station right now. Life is flowing through the airwaves. All the citizens around the world, guys, it's walk, walk, walk. So let's feed, let's eat God's word tonight as we get ready for this massive walk in 2023. Can I have a powerful amen? All right, let's get in the word. Second Peter chapter 3, verse number 15, in Christ's reality, season 4. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also. According to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Next verse. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. <clears throat> so we began to look at Brother Paul's thinking pattern, the Sophia, the insight that was given to Brother Paul where the Old Testament or the Jewish scriptures are concerned. His way of thinking and his way of looking at those scriptures by virtue of the insight that was given to him, you know, to fulfill this dispensation of the gospel to us. And we've, we've traveled quite some distance. I'll encourage you to get the materials if you're just newly joining us because we have really gone some distance in this teaching. So we began to look at Brother Paul's Israel and we began to look at Jesus' Israel too. Uh, you know, uh, not like they are too different, but the consistency of their thoughts on Israel. <clears throat> and we began by saying, number one, for you to understand the Israel that Brother Paul was talking about and the Israel that Jesus made reference to, you must first of all understand the God of Israel, the Yahweh Elohim, you know, of Israel. That is, Israel's Yahweh, here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. The Lord, our God, is one, one Lord. They are seen together. The Lord, our God. So you must know Israel's God. And Israel's God is revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. Then we began to look at also the second thing which has to do with the law. Because if Israel is a nation, the nation must have a law. And we say that law is the law of faith. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And it's a law of the spirit. A law that is predicated on what Christ has done in the heart of the believer. Then we also looked at the circumcision. Okay, the circumcision. Because circumcision is such a big thing among Jewish people. And we saw that the circumcision that the scriptures teach is a circumcision of the heart. And we began to see that Abraham was justified before circumcision. And we agreed from scripture that Abraham's physical circumcision in Genesis chapter 17 was a, a, a sign of what had already happened in his heart in Genesis chapter 15 verse number 6. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. Then we went from circumcision and we began to see this distinct nation called Israel. The uniqueness, the distinct nation. And we said what makes Israel distinct and unique 
is a spirit, is a nation that is born of the spirit, is a nation that is born of God's life. And then we moved from there yesterday, we began to look at faith facts concerning this nation called the nation of Israel. Psalms chapter 2 from verse number 6, I'd like to read that. Psalms chapter 2 from verse 6. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Next verse. I will declare the decree, the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And this is the day of resurrection. Okay, next verse. <clears throat> Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. And we say that word, Ask of me, is the word shall, S H E. A-A-L, it means to seek, to seek. And we establish that when we go out for evangelism, we are asking for the nations. We are seeking for these people for whom Jesus died, evangelism. And it's not talking about physical possession, he is talking about men. So when Jesus now says, go and make disciples of every nation, he is actually talking about taking the nations, the nations for his possession and for his inheritance. The heart of men. Romans chapter 4 verse 13. Brother Paul will throw his weight behind those statements. Romans chapter 4 verse 13. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law. But through the righteousness of faith. Abraham is the heir of the world not through the law but through the righteousness which is of faith. And Abraham being the heir of the world, remember, in his seed. Okay? So he's talking about the seed of Abraham. And that is what Paul meant when he said that Abraham is the heir of the cosmos. Now, so Jesus has inherited the earth by his resurrection. That prayer in Psalm has been answered in the resurrection of Jesus. So we have that authority now. And Jesus has demonstrated his meekness in his death and resurrection. And now the earth is his. The gospel is ours to preach. We are God's voice on the earth. We are God's hands on the earth. We are God's body on the earth. God does nothing on the earth without a man. God does nothing on the earth without a man. If God is going to move, man will have to move. If God is going to move, man will have to move. When we say God is moving, what we mean is that men are moving. Men are moving in the carrying out of the great commission. Men are moving in executing the redemptive work of Christ in the hearts of men through the preaching of the gospel. So God's method is man. God can do nothing on the earth outside of men. So men must be willing, men must be available and cooperate with God as co-laborers. The scripture tells us that we are co-laborers together with God. God co-labors with us. He is in us, walking through us on the earth to bring in the harvest of men for whom Jesus died. Can I have a powerful amen? So it is we that are going to preach and Paul leverages on all of that and explains Christ to us in details in the epistles. Now, Galatians chapter 4 now makes sense. How is it possible for Christ to have all nations as one? It can only be by the Spirit. God can only have all nations together as one by the Spirit. It cannot be by human birth. It has to be by the Spirit. And the Spirit through the gospel. So God sent forth the spirit of his son, Galatians chapter 4, give me verse 4 to 6, Galatians chapter 4 from verse 4 to 6. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law. Next verse. To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption, the euthesia of sons, placement as sons. Next verse. And because you are sons, God has set forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. 
the spirit of his son has been set forth in our hearts. Now let me ask you a question. By setting forth the spirit of his son in our hearts, is God achieving a family? Yeah, he's achieving a family. And the DNA of that family universal is his spirit. The DNA of God's family universal is his spirit. He has set forth the spirit of his son in our hearts. Because he that has not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So God has set forth the spirit of God in the heart of the believer is the DNA of God in the believer. That was, that's what makes all of us the family of God. How do we know that? That's the reason why Jesus had to be raised from the dead. He had to be raised from the dead. Because in the incarnation, it was impossible for God to have a family. In the incarnation, it was impossible for God to have a family. Because it will mean a man will have to come from God to be in the family. But to come from the dead will mean there will be a prototokos. To come from the dead will mean that there will be a prototokos, a seed after his kind. And this family of God is born that way by faith. All of us were born from the dead. The book of Kabodagaya, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 1 to verse 6. And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. All of us were dead in sins and trespasses. But he quickened. The word quickened means he made us alive. How did he make us alive? By his spirit. Next verse. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience. Among whom also we all had our conversation in time past. In the loss of our flesh. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature the children of wrath even as others. Next verse. But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Next verse. Even when we were dead in sins. He hath quickened us. Had quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. And has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenlies in Christ Jesus. Glory to God. So we have been raised together with Jesus. And we are seated together with Jesus as members of his family. So family is now achievable by the gospel. The gospel that Abraham believed by the spirit which is now the seed. And then we began to say, so what land, what land were they promised? I will show you a land. Well, the land will be men all over the world. That land that was promised will be men all over the world as they believe the gospel. That's the land promised. Men all over the world as they believe the gospel. The land will not be in the Middle East. The land will not be Tel Aviv. The land will not be Jordan. The land will not be Nazareth. The land will be men all over the world as they believe in the gospel of his resurrection. The land given to Abraham includes this place, this nation, and every nation. The land given to Abraham includes this place, this nation, and every nation upon the face of the earth. Why? Because Abraham was prefigured of God in Christ. He was prefigured of God in Christ. Who in the resurrection receives the heart of men all over the world. In the resurrection, Jesus receives the heart of men all over the world. Ask of me and I will give you the whole world for your inheritance. So Jesus, by his resurrection, has made that request. In the resurrection of Jesus was a request to own the world. And so Jesus today has that inheritance. He has obtained that inheritance by conquest. He has obtained that inheritance by that inheritance by inheritance. By conquest, by inheritance, Jesus has obtained a more excellent name than they. 
by reason of his death, burial, and resurrection. What it simply means is that in the resurrection of Christ, Jesus lays a legal claim to the earth and those that should be saved in the earth. He lays a legal claim. He lays a legal claim on the earth by his resurrection and those that should be saved in the earth. Glory to God. And so Paul brings it into bear. Romans chapter 1 verse 3 and 4. Romans chapter 1 verse 3 and 4. Concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Pay attention. And declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So kingship, the kingship of Jesus is prefigured in David. The kingship of Jesus is prefigured in David. And the family of Jesus is prefigured in Abraham. The family of Jesus, Abraham. The kingship of Jesus, David. But interestingly, before Abraham was Adam. Before Abraham was Adam. And before David was Saul. Well, don't bother about it. They just look alike. Kingship, David. Family, Abraham. And Jesus said, the two in his resurrection, the two of them, whose son is he? <laughs> the Christ. Whose son is he? Oh, they said, David's son, of course. Oh. If he is David's son, why does David in the spirit call him Lord? The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. They went away and from that day nobody asked him a question. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He is David's Lord. He is David's Lord. Glory to God. That means the father's kingdom is a family. The father's kingdom is a family. And the family is a kingdom. The father's kingdom is a family. And the family is a kingdom. We are joined as with a son. We are children of the kingdom. We are family. We are one. The father's family is a kingdom. And the father's kingdom is a family. So brother Paul brings in the two of them. Abraham justified by faith. And David saying the blessedness of the man. Unto whom God imputed righteousness without works. So both David and Abraham agree on the fact that a man is righteous devoid of works and devoid of the law. And two of them are very important figures in the natural Israel. He is also talking about Abraham because in Abraham we have the Judah which is the praise. And we will see it in, in a bit. We have kingdom as well. And we will have dominion on the earth. Just like Adam had dominion. And that dominion interestingly will never be tyranny. The dominion of Jesus is not tyranny. The dominion of Jesus is not oppressive. The dominion was seen in Christ in his servanthood. The dominion of Jesus finds expression in service. The dominion of Jesus is not force. It's not oppression. It's not tyranny. The dominion of Jesus is expressed in the place of service, not in violence. The dominion of Jesus is in his goodness. The dominion of Jesus is in his mercy and love. The dominion of Jesus is in his graciousness. So the family is in Abraham and the kingdom is in David. Look at the Ishmael narrative in Galatians chapter number four what we what have we simply done pay attention we have simply skipped the law of sin and death and have seen the law of faith every time you see what god will do 
that is Christ. When you read the Old Testament scriptures and you see what God will do, that is Christ. When you see what you will do, that is works. When you see what God will do, that is Christ. So you will track what Jesus did in Luke 24 in the words of the prophets. You will track it in the words of the prophets that required no human performance, that only required faith. When you study the prophets and you see what does not require performance and only requires faith, that is a pointer to the work of Christ. Those are the Christocentric scriptures of the Old Testament. Every time you see that, you are seeing Christ in the Old Testament. If you're with me on this page, can I have a powerful amen? So Galatians chapter 4, brother Paul now brings in Ishmael to bear. Galatians 4.21. Mm -mm -mm. Galatians 4.21, put it up for me. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? Please pay attention. Next verse. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. Remember, there was no law until Exodus. Huh? He is saying that Ishmael prefigures the law. Because Ishmael is in Genesis. And you're talking law in Genesis. Meanwhile, there was no law of Moses in Genesis, even though there was a law in Genesis. But the law of Moses is what they are talking about when the name of Ishmael is mentioned. So Ishmael prefigures the law of Moses. Because the law is a product of the flesh. And so, when he mentions Ishmael here, remember he said, the law was added because of what? Transgression, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. The law wasn't the original plan. But the promise preceded the flesh. The promise preceded the law. What he's saying is that God's promise precedes the works of the law. Even though Isaac looked like the second born. Isaac looked like the second born. Isaac is the first born because he came by promise. Isaac is the first born because he is born of the spirit. That is Paul's narrative. And you can get that very clearly. And so he says to you, this is about the law and grace and faith. This, this allegory here is about the law and grace and faith. Look at verse 23 and 24 of that Galatians chapter 4. But he who was of the bond woman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise. Next verse. Which things are an allegory for these are the two covenants. The one from the Mount Sinai which gendered to bondage which is Aga. The word allegory there is the word allegoria in the Greek which means figure. It's a figure of speech. Give me verse 25 and 26 please pay attention. For this Aga is Mount Sinai in Arabia. And answer it to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. So he uses both of them to talk about the flesh and the spirit. He prefigures it just like the writer of Hebrews uses Esau as a profane, godly person. Profane, godly person. In Hebrews chapter 12, the writer of Hebrew uses Esau. Brother John uses Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel as righteousness and unrighteousness, as love and hate. 
Like I said the other time, they are representations either of the spirit or of the flesh. So you can see what Hebrews 11.1 1 now means. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So you will see things like, I will, I will, I will, I will, will be God's promise. I will, will be God's action found in Christ. I will, is God's promise. I will, will be God's action that is found in Christ. You will see that in Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 15, Genesis chapter 17, and Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 12, 15, 17, and 22. I will, I will, I will. The word epagelia in the Greek, epagelia, and it is spelled as E P A double G E L I A L I A, epagelia. What Paul will call the promise of God or a self fulfilling promise. A self fulfilling promise. Epagelia. Either in Romans chapter 4, verse 13. Or in 2 Corinthians 18 to 21. The promise is the same. God's promise is the spirit. God's promise is the spirit. That we might receive the promised spirit through faith. The promise is God's spirit. So the promise given to Abraham was a pneumaticus. Pneumaticus. That is the promise given to Abraham was a promise of the spirit. Genesis 17 and Genesis 15 verse 1. It was a promise of the spirit. I am your reward. I am your shield. All of that comes together in what God is doing in Christ. If we're the same page, can I have a good amen? So he is saying there is coming a time when the whole earth will have just one DNA. There is coming a time when the whole earth, that's a dream, that's a plan, that's a promise of God. The whole earth will have just one DNA all over the world. The spirit of God is moving and the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water covers the sea. The hidden acts of me I will give you. So the promise of God, the dream of God, the vision of God and the work of Christ on the earth is to have the whole world bearing the same DNA. And this DNA will not be of the flesh. It will be a DNA of the spirit. So brother Paul's Israel and the kingdom that brother Paul talked about is found in Christ. The Israel of brother Paul is found in Christ. So Paul's Israel and Paul's kingdom are both found in Christ. Righteousness, peace, joy where? In the Holy Ghost, what is that? That is the kingdom. The kingdom of brother Paul and the kingdom of Jesus is found in the spirit. Is a kingdom of the spirit. It's not a physical kingdom. Jesus already said, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. That's why in this world we are strangers and pilgrims. We don't belong. Our kingdom is not of this world. They were waiting for the kingdom at one time. He said, the kingdom does not come by observation. The kingdom is within you. The kingdom is spiritual. So God's kingdom and God's family is found in Christ. Either Abraham or David. And so that is brother Paul's argument. He presents the narratives of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And shows, shows us exactly what God has done in Christ. So quickly, let's have a few takeaways. In talking about Christ, therefore, Paul is in no way putting down Israel. He is only 
pointing out who Israel is. He is not putting Israel down, but he is giving Israel the right definition. He is making us understand who Israel is. If you are in the flesh, you will think he is denying Israel. But when you step up into faith, you will see he is affirming and confirming Israel. Israel is in all the world. Israel is in all the world. Israel is found in the spirit anywhere in the world. Israel is found in the spirit anywhere in the world. Because Israel is all over the world. That's why he uses the word, neither Greek nor Jew, neither bond nor free, but in the spirit, the same. So Abraham sought for a city, a police, a people. He didn't seek for a space. He sought for a people. He was not seeking for a physical land. He was looking for a people, a city, whose builder and maker is God. I will build my church. I will build my church. And he was not talking about a physical construction. He was talking about his body. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And they said, how can you? Men in the flesh think in terms of the natural. But when you step up in faith, you now understand that when he's talking about a city and a people, he's talking about men that will be found where? In Christ. I'm not hearing a powerful amen. amen. This city is in all the world. What it means is that in the mind of God, the Genesis factor will come to play someday. When this earth will be populated only by God's sons. That's the plan of God. A day is coming where anywhere you turn in this earth, you will only see sons of God. You will only see men of the spirit. All over the earth. All over the world. Glory to God. I say glory to God. God is not sending his children out of the world. No. God is not sending us out. What was the prayer of Jesus in the high priestly prayer of John chapter 17 verse 15? Put it up for me. Let's read it together. Everybody like a mass choir. This is Jesus speaking to the Father. Or Jesus speaking to the Father. John chapter 17 verse 15. Can we all go together everybody? And you know, how many of you know, Jesus said, Father, I thank you that you hear me. So if Jesus prays a prayer, what is, what is the guarantee? Is answered. So let's go. One to go. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Jesus doesn't want us out of this world. He wants us kept here and preserved. Because his dream is that one day all over the world, men of the spirit will be everywhere. Glory to God. He is reclaiming. And Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Quoting from, from Psalm 24. 1 Corinthians 10, 28. Look at the way Brother Paul puts that reminder very intelligently. He says, But if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols, it not for his sake that showed it. And for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord. There are no idols. That's what Paul is saying. There are no idols. But to help him because he doesn't know better. Ignore the thing. But we know that there are no gods. Who is Yahweh? Yahweh is Isios. Jesus. The earth is the Lord's. The earth is Jesus's. And the fullness thereof. That means there is coming a time, just like the promise given to Abraham, which was said to Adam, when the whole earth will be filled, populated, replenished by the image of God in man. Now that man is called the new creation. The whole earth. So the meek, which is Christ, will inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, which is Christ himself. For they shall inherit the earth. And we are found in him. So the same thing will happen. One day will come. 
it will be one DNA. Glory to God. I'm not hearing you shout glory. You can see that was wrong. You can see that what was wrong in Genesis 11, 1, what they were trying to do was only possible by the spirit. You remember? The Tower of Babel. What they wanted to do was, was only going to be possible by the spirit. One speech, one language, one nation, and God has done that in Christ. In Christ today, we have one speech. We are one nation. Born into the spirit of God. Baptized into Christ. Hallelujah. Ha I said hallelujah. We are one language, one speech, one nation. So the spirit now becomes our foretaste. Before we get there, the spirit is the foretaste of things to come. Oh, what a foretaste. Of glory divine. What are the things to come? The body will be glorified. The body will be glorified. And whatever happens to the body will happen to the earth. Selah. Whatever happens to the body will happen to the earth. The, glory, the body will be glorified. And so yet again, what was promised? Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Let's make man in our image, after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fowls of the air, over all of that. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, and God bless them. It will be seen in the earth through the image of God in Christ Jesus. So Paul will say in Galatians chapter 3 verse 26, put it up for me. Galatians chapter 3 verse 26. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. You are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Next verse. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. How many of you have been baptized into Christ here? Say with me, I have put on Christ. Shout it very loud. I want the radio audience to hear you. Next verse. Next verse. Kayada Baha. Next verse. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one well in Christ Jesus. Neither Jew or Gentile. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. Put it up for me. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 13. For by one spirit, how many spirit? By one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. By one spirit. So what makes us one is the spirit. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. We've all been made to drink into one spirit. Don't you never say, I have drank of the spirit. Yeah. Have you drank of the spirit? Lego Shakaya. Brene Gagaga. I have been made to drink into that one spirit. So the gospel is for every creature. And so Paul will say that this gospel has been given to all of us. Peter will say, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Oh, I love that one. First Peter. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. They are all saying the same thing. One nation, one language, one tribe, royal priesthood, chosen generation, holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into where his marvelous light. It has nothing to do with the Middle East. But with people who are pneumaticos. Where are the pneumaticos generation? Are they in the building? Shout glory. First John 3, 24. Look at how John will say the same thing we are reading from the different apostles. And he that keepeth his commandment dwelleth in him. And he in him. And hereby we know. Hey. We what? We know. That he abided in us. How? By the spirit which he will give us. 
which he has given. So how do we know that God abides in us? Not by the way we feel, but by the presence of the Spirit. So the Spirit of God in you is the DNA of God in you. That's how you know. How do you know that Jemima is my first daughter? By DNA. If I take her now to the lab and we do a DNA test with her, my DNA and hers are the same. That's what makes her my biological daughter. That's the proof that she came from me. How do we know that you are born of God? How do you know that you are born of the Spirit? Agabadaga, the DNA of God, which is the Spirit of God. God has set forth the Spirit of His Son. Where? In our hearts. And what is the cry of that Spirit? So all of us united by one Father. One Spirit makes us one body. And we speak the same language. Jakun kanke klandongra tasakaya. Hele shakaya. Glory to God. Somebody shout, I'm born of the Spirit. Born, born, born again. I am born, born again. Born, born, born again. I am born, born again. I am born of the Spirit. Wash in His blood. I am born, born again. Some of you are just looking at me like that. When did you get born again? Why don't you know these songs? <laughs> I am born of the Spirit. Washed in His blood. I am born, born again. Glory to God. I'm born of the Spirit, washed in His blood. I am born, born again. Are you not born again? I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man. Old things are passed away. I'm born again. More than a conqueror. That's who I am. I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man. These are all our songs of identification. Acknowledging every good thing that is where in us because we are where in Christ. He said we know that we are of God by the spirit which he has given to us. What do you mean you are of God? Well, he didn't talk to the Jew. He says you because greater is he that is in. In in you. That's why you are of God. So the narratives are very clear. That's Paul and the apostles. They reworked Israel in Christ. That can be an Israel outside Christ. No. What they are talking about cannot be an Israel outside Christ. The only Israel that is God's Israel is where? In Christ. So Romans 11.25 Romans 11.25 For I will not brethren that you should be ignorant of this mystery <laughs> lest you should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part is happened to Israel. Hmm? <laughs> Until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Next verse. And so, all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Sion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. When he said all Israel shall be saved, he's not talking about the Middle East. He's talking about this Israel. You know this one, not that one, this one. So Christ, therefore, is Israel's Messiah. For salvation is of the Jews. That's key. So the reason for the physical Israel, for lack of a better word, permit me to use this. The reason for the physical Israel is for the Messiah to put on a human body. That's the reason. And once Messiah put on a human body, Israel, the physical Israel, expired in their usefulness. 
So the real Israel is in the resurrection. So Jesus is the Jew. Jesus is the Israel. Jesus is the Israel. He is the Jew. He is the Israel. Or the Israel is in Christ. The Israel is where? Is in Christ. Thank you Lord. Galatians chapter 6 verse 16. See the way brother Paul will, will you know, bring more, more, more expression to that. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. The Israel of God. We walk by the same rule. Which is this Israel called the Israel of God? Is the church of God. He calls them the true Israel. <laughs> Paul is talking about the Israel that is not of physical circumcision. But of the heart. The one Hosea said, I will call a people that are not my people, my people. Hosea said it in prophecy. Ezekiel said, these people, I will write my laws in their hearts. Jeremiah, another prophet, said, the one I will write in their hearts is not the type that I gave unto their fathers when I brought them out of Egypt, but I will write my laws in their hearts and they shall not teach every man to know the Lord, but all shall know me from the least to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their transgressions and their sins and iniquities. I will remember them again no more. Glory to God. So the reason for that physical Israel was for God to have a human descent. And that's all. But the reason for that is to give birth to men by the spirit. So God used a physical Israel to put on a flesh. God in flesh is going to give birth to men in the spirit. You didn't get that. God used physical Israel to gain access into humanity. Then now. The God who came in human flesh using the physical Israel will give birth to a spiritual Israel. An Israel of God, a true Israel that are born of the spirit. So the faithfulness of God therefore is found in Christ. The question I want to ask is, did God replace Israel with the church? Think, think, think. Don't be in a hurry. These are very tricky questions. Very tricky questions. They are very tricky questions. Think again. And I'm going to ask in another 10 seconds. Did God replace Israel with the church? Think. <laughs> Very tricky question. Okay. So can we answer one more time? Did God replace Israel? He had the English. <laughs> Did God replace Israel with the church? No. No. Israel has always been the church. The church being Israel is not an afterthought. It's the thought. It's the plan from the beginning. But in order for God to achieve that plan, he used physical Israel to come in so that that plan can be brought in. How many of you understand what I just explained here? Now, so, It's just that the first people place their attention on the wrong things. God didn't replace Israel with the church. Neither are both of them fulfilling different promises. No. For you to think like that, that would be funny now. 
That would be dual plan. God has a singular plan. The Israel of God has been, will be, will always be found in the church. The Israel of God will always be found in the church. That's why the resurrection of Christ was very critical. If Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, there will be no gospel. There will be no gospel. Everything said to Abraham is just a mere story. If Jesus was not raised from the dead, that resurrection of Jesus is what validates everything. Because all God said to Abraham never happened when Abraham was here. Every promise. All God said to Abraham only took effect and happened in the resurrection. In the resurrection. So God did not replace Israel with the church. Israel is God's or Christ's people. The people of Christ. When you hear the people of God, which God are we talking about? Yahweh, who is found where? In Christ. So quickly, let's look at a few things. So here is Abraham, Genesis chapter 15. He sees his seed in a strange land. God said, I will come in judgment and I will take them and read them out of judgment. That's interesting. I believe that that really was a vision of the past. Humanity was found in bondage. Even Egypt, for lack of a good word, was in bondage to Egypt. For lack of an expression. Egypt was in bondage to Egypt. There was bondage. And Paul makes us see that the issue was in Egypt. The issue was sin and death. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so, all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who have not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression who is the figure the pattern of sin which is to come okay now so he said this nation will be liberated and that's exactly what Jesus said on the table this is my body broken for you this is my blood of the new testament which is shed for the remission of sins this nation will be liberated so when you read Paul talking about lead, what is lead? Lead is Exodus account. What about redemption? Apollothrosis. Is the language of what? The language of Exodus. What about temple? Or tabernacle? Exodus language. What about Passover? Exodus language. What about all the washings? Washings. Washings. Leviticus language. Washings are Leviticus language. What about sacrifices? Leviticus language. What about unbelief? Huh? Numbers. Correct. All of these are prefiguring Christ. So Paul is saying, now if it was possible for these guys to be rescued from Egypt and still have Egypt in their hearts, they came out of Egypt totally delivered. But Egypt still hid itself in the house. It is possible for someone to be born again and in your mind you have the flesh. In your mind you are full of flesh but you are born again. So he uses the same narrative. Egypt is symbolic. Therefore, murmuring and grumbling Then he warns, let him that think at his standard, take heed lest he fall into sin. We are redeemed, no doubt, taken out of Egypt by the Spirit. But if we don't renew our minds, we will act out what Israel did from Egypt in the wilderness. The renewing of our mind. Which is what we learned before we got into this series on spiritual growth. How many of you remember that? Okay, now... So when you hear murmurings, Paul talked about murmurings. 
In Philippians chapter 2, it says, Do not murmur like they murmured. Do all things without murmurings. He is using the Israel account from Egypt. When you hear about the flesh, he is using Israel's account from Egypt. Where did they get the example of sin? The flesh. Paul calls it the flesh. And what did he use as the flesh and sin? The people with whom God was not pleased. The people with whom God was not pleased in the wilderness. Who produced the works of unbelief. The works of the flesh are manifest. So if Christ is in the food. Christ is in the water. If Christ is in the rock. It means food, water, rock are statements of the spirit. They are statements of the spirit. So the same way Joshua and Caleb prefigures men who believe the gospel in spite of all evidence. In spite of all evidence, they believe the gospel. The spies went to the promised land and brought exhibit and said, we went there, look at the proof, but we cannot enter. Joshua and Caleb said, I don't care what evidence you guys have. Let's go up at once. We don't even need a strategy. We can run over this city. He said, I swear you people will not enter the land. Except Joshua and Caleb because they have another spirit. We also, having the same spirit of faith, we believe. Therefore, we speak. Then those guys who worship idols will prefigure carnality. Those guys in the Exodus story who worship idols. So when I read the Bible, I read backwards. I read about idol worship, murmurings. What's the message? The works of the flesh. Idol worship, murmurings in the wilderness. They are prefiguring the work of the flesh. Romans chapter 15 verse 4. Whatsoever things were written, put it up for me, Romans 15 verse 4. Whatsoever things were written aforetime, they were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So I must with the eye of the spirit see the flesh in the Old Testament and see the spirit in the Old Testament. I see in Esau godlessness. He doesn't care what God's promise is. Esau is a type of those Christians that have no value for the honor God has placed on their lives. Esau is prefiguring believers who are in church and have no respect for spiritual things. Profane. They are in church. They are born again. But they don't value spiritual things. So they can sell their birthright for porridge. It, it means nothing to them. Their, their Christian life has no value when food appears on the table. They have no value for the things of God. Oh, no, 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 no. They cannot miss a contract appointment for Bible study. Instead, let the Bible study never happen forever. But as long as they get that contract. Those are grouped as Esau. They are the Esau. They have no value. Profanity reigns in them. They have no value for spiritual things. So you see them in church for long, but they have not raised any disciple. They are Esau, Esau's brethren. They are not involved in evangelism. They are not involved in anything that allows them to be of a blessing to the body of Christ. No, they have no value. If you tell them you are called by God, they say, who called? Me? Call K. Call Ko. Call me. Eh? Mm -mm. They are not interested. They are happy to be in church and they come late. They come when Bible study has gone 30 minutes halfway and they hide under the gallery. They never come on time. They are always sitting under the gallery 
Even though there's enough seed. No, no. Because late coming and them have entered an eternal partnership. They come, but late. They come, but in a way that they can never understand what is taught. Because half of it has gone. So what they are hearing is strange. Till the service is over. By the time they come for the next service, they come late. So they can never gather understanding. They only have half, half, half things hanging. And when they ask them question, even their answer will make you know that they have never come to church. Esau generation. <laughs> very godless. Very unserious. They are born again. They are already in heaven. But very unserious. When it's prayer, they will go out and be greeting everybody, including people passing on the road. <laughs> After you know how now? I they greet, oh? Well done. I they greet. They are never serious. They will be outside counting cars. One, two, three, four. Hi. People came here today. Very unserious. Then when they hear prayer is rounding off, they now come in. Then when they come in, they sit under the gallery. They sit where nobody can hold them accountable. They don't want to be where we can see them and see that they were not in church yesterday. They are in church. They, they, they came late. <laughs> they sit where you never know when they came and when they didn't come. They can even leave before teaching is over. They came late, copied nonsense, and left before the nonsense that they are copying finished. So when you read their note, it doesn't make sense. And they don't even have the discipline. They don't have the discipline to sit down at home and go through the message. Ah, no. For where now? They can never do it. They don't have the discipline profanity. I see in Cain hatred, flesh. I see in the Israelites that they pass through the sea with Moses, murmuring, grumbling, complaining. The flesh was big among them. So I see the power demonstrated as today's charisma. Today's charisma. All of us have that power inside us. We have utterance. We have revelation. And all of these manifestations of all trans revelation power in us, they are all our abilities as citizens of this nation. And this nation is a nation by the Spirit. I see redemption in the blood of Christ. Colossians chapter 1, verse 14. I'm teaching good. Yeah. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Redemption, apolothrosis. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. Pay attention, I'm going to ask you a question. Ephesians 1 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Question. Colossians 1 14 and Colossians 1 7. Which language is that? The language of where? Exodus. So, the pillar of fire and pillar of cloud are a prefiguring of the work of the Spirit. They prefigure the work of the Spirit. And Paul does a little bit in looking at the book of Daniel. Look at what Paul said, and I'm going to drop something, and I'm going to leave you to chew on it. Teaching good? 1 Corinthians 15.25 1 Corinthians 15, 25. And I'm going to read to 29. For he must reign till he had put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he had put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. Next verse. And when all things shall be subdued under him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Hmm. So, Daniel and also Ezra, that's why Paul will now make 
a loud boast by saying, what shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ? Nakedness, peril, sword, things present, things to come, life, death, principality, power, nothing in this life, nothing in the life to come shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ. Romans 3, 28 to 29, I mean to 39. That means the believer will never come to condemnation and the believer will never come to destruction and the believer will never come to wrath. No condemnation, no destruction, no wrath for the believer. So Paul has reworked Israel in Christ. He has replaced Israel. I mean, he hasn't replaced Israel. He has just shown you who Israel is. The Israel of God. If Abraham is who he is, and they ignore all of Abraham outside his faith, in other words, in Abraham, we have Ishmael. In Abraham, we have Isaac. And he picks Israel from Ishmael, not Isaac. That's the same way the study is. Which means Israel is not neglected or replaced. Israel is affirmed in Christ. And Paul weathers in a little more. In Romans chapter 4. In Romans chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8. Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 8. I'm teaching good. In Romans 6, he talks about baptism. In Romans chapter 6. Baptism which is passing through the Red Sea. As soon as that happens, Romans 7 comes up. He talks about the law as they cross the sea. In their unbelief, they were given the law. So Romans chapter 6, baptized into Moses. Pass through the sea. Romans chapter 7, the law. The law. He that is married to a husband, as long as the husband liveth, the wife is bound by the law of her husband. You remember that narration of Brother Paul? But when the husband is dead, the woman is free. She shall not be called an adulterer. Even so you, the law is dead. You are now free to be married to Christ. So you and Christ can bring forth fruit. So from chapter 6, baptism, he comes to chapter 7, where the law has no bound over you. Then chapter 8, he now tells you there's no condemnation. Chapter 8, he now tells you for the law of the spirit of life, where in Christ Jesus has set you free from what? The law of sin and death. Where did he get that narration from? Huh? The book of Exodus. The journey of Israel from Egypt to the promised land and the events that happened on the way. So within all that account, Paul points that, paints that picture to us. Now, the burial of Jesus is our burial. And the burial of Jesus is our salvation. The giving of the law happened to the Jews. And brother Paul fixed that. The law of the spirit of life frees the believer from the law of sin and death. So don't forget that Adam, therefore, will not be a dominant figure. Adam will not be a dominant figure. The way some theologians, you know, they paint Adam. They paint Adam as if Adam is in all of us. No. Adam is not in anybody. Adam is only a prefiguring of a man without Christ. Abraham, Adam is a prefiguring of a man without Christ. Abraham is a prefiguring of a man with Christ. Adam prefigures a man without Christ. Abraham prefigures a man with Christ. Or a man in Christ. So Jesus did not die for the sins of Adam. Huh? Yeah. Which means Adam is not a dominant figure. So very carefully we can say, carefully, don't go beyond what I'm going to say now. Like Abraham, like Adam. Adam prefigures the unbeliever. Abraham eh, 
prefigures the believer. So the Exodus is into a tabernacle. Israel exited into a tabernacle. Romans chapter 8 verse 2 For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Give me verse 9. Pay attention to verse 9 of Romans chapter 8. He says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell where? In. In you. So the exodus produced the indwelling. The book of Exodus produced the indwelling of the spirit. The tabernacle. 1 Peter 2.5 You are a spiritual house. 1 Peter 3.24 And Romans 8.14-16 to 16. Romans 8.14-16 How many of you remember? Israel is my firstborn. Huh? Israel is what? All that is reworked into Christ. The paternity is Abraham. The kingdom is in David. Did you remember that? And both of them recognize that there is a J. Ray, Yahweh. So the psalmist will say, What is man that thou art mindful of him, nor the son of man that you visit? Then he said, when we look at this man, we do not yet see everything put under him. Then we look up and we see Jesus, who was made a little lower for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. And through death he has brought many sons to glory. So both he that sanctified and they that are sanctified are all of one for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Glory to God. So people assume that all things is buying a new car and a new house. He's talking about the complete dominion that is found in Christ. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. When he uses the word last, it doesn't mean that his first, second and third enemy. Last is just Bible language. It means the only enemy. Just like seek ye first. It doesn't mean there is second, third, fourth. Seek ye first is Bible language. It means seek only. Seek only the kingdom of God. It's not like seek ye first God, then seek car. Uh -uh. The only thing to seek is God. When you have God, you have everything. Is it clear? So the last enemy is not like they say first and second and third enemy. The last enemy is a construction. Because in the resurrection of Jesus also, it prefigures the believer's body, which will be glorified. Look at it, 1 Corinthians 15, 54. Glory to God. 1 Corinthians 15, 54. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up. Where? In victory. Right now, when you are born again, you have defeated death. How many of you know that? Death has no power over the believer. You pass from death to life. You are in life. The law of the spirit of life, where? In Christ Jesus, has set you free from what? The law of sin and death. You have defeated death. Okay? But in your mortality, you are yet to defeat death in this body. Okay? So, when this body shall put on, shall wear that body that is inside your spirit awaiting the time, death will no more be found anywhere. Your body will no more have malaria. Your body will no more have cancer ulcer. Your body will no more have blood pressure. Your body will no more have aches and pain and weakness and ah, I'm tired. No. You will put on a body that is eternal. Incorruptible. Undefiled. That faded not able. A body that does not depreciate. You understand? No recalls. No, no age. It remains eternally like that. You will wear that body. And you already have it. 
is inside you right now. Now, that kibata, that will be the last redemption. That will be the final victory over death. So listen, a brother in Christ that kept saying, I shall not die, I shall not die, I shall not die, and he died, has not been defeated. You know why he has not been defeated? The solution to I shall not die is already inside him. So he may, he may, he may exit this body, but he will wear the other body. That is not, that is not loss. That is not, that's not defeat. That's not defeat. That's not defeat. That brother just removed this one to wear the other one. It's just that because you are on earth, there is time. So you are feeling that between when he removed this one to wear this one, it took time. In eternity, it's now. In eternity, it's days as a thousand years. A thousand years is as a day. That's why when brethren who have Christ die, we don't weep because they are not dead. They only slept. They will wake up on the resurrection day because what will wake them up is already inside them. But since they decided and cooperated to sleep, let them sleep. But they will wake up. Why it is called sleep is because if you sleep, you will wake up. That's why it is called sleep. Abi, is there anybody that sleeps forever? If you sleep this night, won't you wake up? No matter how deep they sleep. Even if they sleep, you sleep and fall for ground. You know, there are some people when they sleep, you can carry them and move them to another room. And they are not aware. You know, there are people like that. They are heavily gifted. And there are some people, once they sleep and anything, even if mosquitoes do, wham, they are awake. But there are some people, they are blessed. They don't know where they are. You can even carry them and keep them at the gate of their house. They will just do, and continue. <laughs> keep it is beloved, very smooth. But the, when they have slept, they sleep. They wake up. So wake up and say, ah, what's up, man? You know, when I was in school, when I was in secondary school, one man drank and got drunk with alcohol Saturday night. Got so drunk and moved and moved and moved and moved and finally came and laid down in front of my door. Directly on my door. He just laid down pressing my door and slept there. Sunday morning, I was going to preach. I woke up in the morning. Secondary school. I woke up after praying my early morning prayer, shower, dressed up, and then I'm opening the door, and there's a wedge on the door. I'm pushing the door. The door is not opening, and I'm looking to see whether there's anything they did to my door. Then I pushed, and I heard one man, I heard somebody do, mm -mm. <laughs> I saw a human being lying down, so I pushed the door some more. Then he sat up. <laughs> Hello, sir. He looked at me. His eyes are red. Then he did like this. Mm. Booze no good. <laughs> Booze no good. <laughs> Booze no good. <laughs> That's exactly what he said. After he said booze no good, he now stood up, cleaned his bum bum. And started going. He said nothing. Only booze, no good. <laughs> A word. <laughs> A man slept. He, he got drunk and slept in somebody's compound in front of somebody's door, not knowing where he was. What took me there? Where you sleep, no matter how deep. Whether with booze or without booze, you will wake up. <laughs> Am I teaching good tonight? One of these days, we put on immortality. Glory to God. We are the heavenly body. And death, death, the last enemy is death of the physical body. And that one will be totally defeated. I didn't hear a powerful amen. amen. So Israel is in Christ. The kingdom is in Christ. When Moses talks about all the earth in one mankind, 
He is talking about Jesus. So question, who is the Jew? Where well, Paul said, the Jew is the born again man. The born again man is the Jew. Romans 2.29 Romans chapter 2 verse number 29. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart. In the spirit and not in the later. Whose praise is not of men but of God. The Jew is the born again man. Christ is the Jew. So really when they were mocking him and they put that inscription on Jesus. King of the Jews. He calls himself king. And Pilate got angry. But really in their mockery was the wisdom of God. He was the real king of the Jew. Because he has a kingdom. And that kingdom is his family. And the family is his kingdom. And in that debt, he will give birth to this nation. The nation of God. Glory to God. So we are the Jews. We are the true Jews. Not of the later, but of the spirit. That's our king. He became king by that mockery. By that sacrifice. The Lord said to my Lord. Another study. Jehovah said to Elohim. That already shows you that that one will be down for the other to raise up. That already shows you that God will become a man. He will die and he will raise his son up. David saw it and prophesied. The prophecy of David stipulated that it is from the resurrection that the kingdom will begin. The kingdom of God therefore is Christ raised from the dead. That's the kingdom of God. Christ raised from the dead. Not beating soldiers or winning wars. No. No. Jesus did that for us. If you see why the cross is foolishness to the Greek and an offense to the Jewish man, it's an offense to the Jew that does not believe because he ignored faith and went for works. But for us who believe, Christ has walked or the scriptures are reworked around Christ. So when we see the cross, we see victory. When we see the cross, we see the new creation. It's foolishness. But unto us that believe, it is the power of God. Neither male, nor female. A few takeaways as I wrap up this. When you hear firstborn, Israel is my firstborn, the prototokos in the Greek, that's the resurrection. It's not talking about the physical Israel. What Jesus did on the road to Emmaus was to rework their thinking. Now take this. Adam is a prototype. Abraham is a prototype. The tabernacle is a prototype because the promise is in the spirit. Now, we don't do prototypes anymore. That they, without us, cannot be made perfect. That in Christ, all that has been perfected. So question, can the delivered man still walk in the flesh? Yes, Israel did in Egypt. They left Egypt, but Egypt never left them. How does he not walk in the flesh, the delivered man, when he stays in the pillar of fire and in the pillar of cloud? He stays in the spirit. He does not gratify the desires of the flesh. He will stay in the spirit. He will remain where the word of God is where the life of God is, you know, where the word of God is taught and his mind is renewed. And when he stays in that environment, he will not fulfill the loss of the flesh. So question, what is Paul's Israel? Paul's Israel will be found where? In Christ. What's Jesus' is Israel? Jesus' is Israel will be found where? In Christ. What Peter's Israel? Peter's Israel is that chosen generation, royal priesthood, a peculiar people, and they are found where? In Christ. They are all pneumaticals. So therefore, it just makes me wonder why people still go to Israel today under the guise of going to see where the tomb is. 
to check the gravesite. You know, a man of God told me years ago, and he, he said we should go to Israel. You know, I told you the one that said we should take offering. Right? This one said we should go to Israel. Let's go and enter the tomb. That the last time he was in the tomb of Jesus in Israel, as he entered the tomb, the Lord said to him, now that you have entered my tomb, anywhere you tell this story, healing miracles will happen. I was so disappointed because this man of God talking to me, somebody I really respect. As he's saying it, the scripture hit my head. Bawa. Why seek he the dead among the living? He is no longer here. Behold, I mean, why seek he the living among the dead? For he is no longer here. Behold where they laid him. If he is no longer there, why are we going to the grave? Are we necromancers? The dead and the living have nothing in common. I don't need to go to a physical site called grave of Jesus. I don't need it. Why do I need grave when the risen one is inside me? Please, if you have money to go to Israel, give me and touch me. Just touch me. Because me, it's not the dead, 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 dead. In fact, do you know that do, after Jesus rose from there, even the body was not there. Even the body was not there because they only met napkin. The napkin that they covered him with all they met. They, he, he was not there. His bones were not there because he rose and took his body. His body was changed. So what are you going there to do? And who even told you that is the place? In case there was even a place like that. Who told you that place is the place? Hey. <laughs> Remember that today, Israel is not the Jerusalem in the Old Testament. I am not saying now, even then there was no replacement. The Israel of God is where? In the spirit. The temple of God is where? In the spirit. The promises of God are where? In the spirit. So Christ is actually the interpretation of the Jewish scriptures. You search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. They are there. Which one? How many of you can see the way we have been reworking all of these scriptures? Can you see that Christ is the, is the substance of the Jewish scriptures? Christ is the substance of the Jewish scriptures. Having seen that, we can now see Christ clearly in the Old Testament letters. Finally, the restoration of the earth will be found in this Israel. The restoration of the earth. Three things. Number one, the salvation. Soteriology. Number two, the family. Ecclesiology. The church. Number three, the missiology. Missiology. That's the mission. So the church is an advancing people. It claims the earth for Christ every day by preaching the gospel. Soteriology, ecclesiology, missiology. We are born into a family. Then it's a family of a mission. Always moving from place to place. Always moving from place to place. All the world. How shall they hear without a preacher? How can the preacher preach except he be sent? Blessed are the feet of those who preach the good tidings. Are those feet sitting here this evening? We preach, we preach, we preach the faithfulness of God. Because what is found in Abraham are all the nations of the earth. Every nation. So the Israel of God are an occupational family. Not for commerce, not for business, but to preach Christ crucified in all the earth. So what God said to Adam, what God said to Abraham about Jesus Christ is being fulfilled in our very eyes. As we watch people raise up their hands to receive Christ. As we watch men coming to the message of Christ, coming to the knowledge of the truth before our eyes. As we people, see people rise up to the challenge of soul winning. That's the promise of God fulfilled. When we hit the streets from Monday to preach and you are in our team and we are moving together, the promise of God to reclaim the earth is being fulfilled by your obedience. As we go from street to street, 
from house to house, from man to man, from woman to woman, from boy to boy, from girl to girl. We are in that army with Jesus Christ, fulfilling the promise he made to Abraham. Adam replaced, I mean, restored it in Abraham, which found expression in Christ that all nations of the earth are blessed through the preaching of the gospel. Is it getting clear here? That's the mandate. That's what it's been from the beginning of time. As we move therefore from place to place, from nation to nation, what are we doing? Ask of me and I will give you the nations to the uttermost part of the earth. You know that's what the devil thought he was going to deceive Jesus to do. If you are the son of God, bow down and worship me. All the kingdoms of this world I will give you. Jesus said it is written. You shall worship the Lord your God. I'm the Lord your God. And him only you will serve. I don't need to bow to you. I know how to get the hearts of men. I will die and rise. And in my resurrection, the earth will be my inheritance. I have news for you. He has risen. He has defeated Satan. He has paid the price. And now salvation is available to all. Let's go and announce it. I didn't hear a powerful amen. So the church, our soteriology, salvation through faith, which is where? In Christ. Ecclesiology, neither Jew nor Gentile, but the new creation in Christ. Our mission, the whole earth. The whole earth. We are to seek and to save those that are lost. Say with me, I have a mandate upon my life to reveal Christ to my world. No man escapes. No woman escapes. I am set on this mission because I am saved by Christ. I serve my generation the purpose of God. I didn't hear your powerful amen. Stand on your feet and say, hey neighbor, hey neighbor, hey neighbor. You have no excuse. I have no excuse. We are fully equipped to bring this truth to the nations of the earth. I didn't hear your amen. amen. I see some of you are still wrapping up your notes. I'm waiting for you. We will do this together. Hey neighbor, hey, neighbor. a dispensation of the gospel has been committed to you. Together, we take the gospel from city to city, from nation to nation, from house to house, from boy to girl, from girl to boy, from family to individuals. We preach Christ and him crucified. We are together with God in the fulfillment of God's promise to have a family of men and women that are born of the Spirit. Hallelujah. Say, neighbor, you are the voice of God. You are the hands of God. You are the physical body that God uses on the earth. If you do not cooperate, you make it difficult for God to fulfill his purpose. On the earth. But I know you are willing. You are obedient. In this day. Of God's power. And that power is at work. On your inside. That power is at work. On your inside. And in the day of my power. My people. Shall be willing. You are his people. You are willing. In this day of his power. We cover the earth. With the fragrance. Of Jesus. I didn't hear your amen. Trust that you have been blessed by this message. To order the complete series of this message and all the messages by Dr. Abel Daminer, please call plus 234-806-800-9939 or email powercityoffice at gmail.com.